Hey yo everybody, Haku here with my review of this week's new Tower of God chapter. So Tower of God chapter uh, 307 this week's so a season 2 episode 227. And uh, this one, SIU or um, CU either way, uh, really brought the deaths on us this week. Uh, as he has been lately, though, I don't think anybody really believes that Rack, Yiwa, and uh, Danwa are actually dead. But um, if they are, man, bringing the deaths on us lately either way. Uh, before I get into breaking the chapter down part by part, one thing I do definitely want to discuss is whether I think they are actually dead, Prince or Akhapter are actually dead, because I saw that that was a big point of contention in a lot of the comments I've been seeing, especially um, in my live reaction as well, um, is people wondering, okay, I think they are confirmed as dead. SIU did talk in the blog I saw a lot of people cite about drawing their deaths, but he could say that as in drawing their fake-out deaths. We don't really completely know at this point. I would personally say I think that Akraptor is dead 100%. Um, but hell, I thought that Wangnam was dead 100% when Beta stabbed him through the back and out of the chest way, way back in um, Workshop Battle. So I have been wrong before with thinking characters were permanently dead. Uh, so SIU, or CU, whatever, could always write a way out of it. Um, Prince, on the other hand, I'm not as convinced as I am with Akraptor simply because I commended last week the writing for Joaquin actually being like, you know, I need to start making some plays, making some moves against Rachel, because that makes sense for him. He doesn't want to be trapped underneath of her which is sort of, uh, figuratively, which is sort of what she is trying to maneuver him into being reliant on her. So um, he doesn't want that and he needs to weaken her team. He really does. I think that still holds true. So I think that Joaquin could still be acting. He could. And say, seeing that we didn't see Prince's actual death on screen and just Joaquin saying that he ate him, that's pretty vague. And we still don't know the total soul absorbing process if Joaquin can actually reverse it, if he really willed it. Um, so, permadeath for Prince, I'm not totally, totally sure about. I would think Akraptor is dead because we got a full flashback. It was a really good and developed scene. With Prince's scene, though, it didn't feel as full, so I could definitely see him still being alive in some way. Uh, so yeah, that's my thoughts. I just thought I'd bring it up just at least a little bit here to explain my thoughts a little bit on whether I think they're permanently dead or not, just because so many people were talking about that. And uh, it'll probably be, I'll talk way, way more about it and way more in depth when we do the Hockey and a video, which may be on Thursday this week, depending on how busy I am tomorrow with school stuff. Um, just because I know that I've gotten a lot of comments on that, so it'll be a major topic for us to discuss. Now actually going through the chapter part by part, one of the first things we see is that they're mentioning Kasano's weight and how it's like carrying two people. So um, it's interesting that Kasano's Pokeball apparently has the weight of a person. So it's like just a very, very heavy, uh, I, I keep calling it the Pokeball because there's really nothing else to call it at this point. That's 100% what it is. Uh, but Akraptor sits Wangnan down so that he can go get Prince and Misang because um, only Akraptor has the code to get into the door. Also, Wangnan warns him because Wangnan is still weary of Joaquin, even though it seems as though he's working with them right now. Well, they get ambushed by Rachel. And of course, Rachel says, of course, that they can use uh, Yura's carrier to get back by teleporting. So I think it'll be interesting if in the future we get a Yuraha versus Androsi fight, since both of them do have items that can allow them to teleport. I think that would make for a very interesting fight in the future. Uh, but um, Rachel does say that Joaquin's not stupid enough to betray her, but by her own logic, I'm thinking he's not stupid enough to not betray her. Not betraying her hurts him possibly a lot more than betraying her does. Uh, of course, he's probably not going to be allowed to have the clone if he totally 100% betrays her, but if he just listens to whatever she says and completely sells out Wang Nin's team, then that hurts him a lot because he is then really trapped with Rachel and he has to rely on her to find his clone to get his power, and he has no real 100% guarantee that she will even do that once she gets what she wants. So, um... 
I think by that logic, he should be um, smart enough to not betray her. Joaquin is very, very arrogant, but he's not stupid arrogant. Um, but either way, Yuraha shows up and takes Wang Nan hostage, so Akraptor is essentially in checkmate. Joaquin, who has apparently betrayed him, has both his teammates, and Wang Nan will die if he does not surrender. So even though under normal circumstances I think that he could take Rachel, he was in checkmate. He didn't want Wang Nan to die, obviously. Um, I'm gonna say now that I'm not totally 100% sure if he could take Yura. I think Yura is actually very powerful. Um, Danwa fell in behind her not just because of his whole um, knight complex, but also because she was very talented and he looked up to her in a certain way, he wanted to save her more emotionally than physically. Um, and also when we saw at the, wood, at the wooden horse arc when she clashed against Kuhn for a bit, Kuhn is a very strong character. We don't really see it that often because he isn't in direct fights that often, but he's very strong in a fight. And she held with him, could even... You could even argue she overpowered him a little bit at range. So, um, of course, ranged fighting isn't necessarily Kuhn's specialty. So it's very, uh, very interesting that she is pretty strong, even if she hadn't taken Wang Nan hostage. Uh, so Akraptor's in checkmate, Joaquin gets the password, and then says he plans to devour Prince or Misang. And again, I still think he, be, he may be making a move against Rachel's team, and he may just be, um... Because the way he just whispers it to Prince, it seems like it is set up for him to have worked something out with Prince to maybe me saying think, thinks that Prince died just to make things even more realistic. I'm not totally convinced at Prince's death yet. So then Rachel says that they need a life to use on the floor of death. So again, very interesting. What do they need a life to use for? Um, so either way, she plans to kill Wang Nan since he's injured, useless, he'd just be a weight for them to carry around. Um, so Akraptor volunteers to die in his place. And Akraptor says, you know, I'm going to either kill you or die trying if you kill him. So if you kill me, he can't do anything. He's already, sorry about the sirens, he's already injured, there's nothing he can do. But if you kill him, you're going to have to kill me and lose that life that you have to use. So uh, then, of course, he uses the quote from the end of last chapter calling Wang Nan a tremendously remarkable guy, and he charges Rachel, which forces her hand. She wanted Yura to kill Wang Nan. She didn't want to do anything. She didn't want blood on her hands. Personally, she didn't want to kill the person, but he charged at her to force her to kill him because he knew that she needed that life, so she was going to have to keep Wang Nan alive if she killed him. Or at least seemingly so, because she needed the hostage to leverage against Bomb as well. So um, he forces Rachel's hand, and uh, then he dies, and the death scene was done very, very well. And of course, Wang Nan is completely crushed because somebody died specifically for him, specifically because of him. Um, and that's what I kind of think again. I'm like, man, they shouldn't have... I mean, Ryun was right that somebody was going to die either way if they didn't get off the train, but man, they shouldn't have taken the small group to go after uh, Joaquin or Casano. If they were going to go after Casano, they should have just stuck with Bomb, because this did not work out for them. <laughs> but um, essentially, after Rachel, also I wanted to bring up, after Rachel kills Akraptor, she seems very disheveled, like afraid or distraught. She's breathing heavily. Like, you can tell that she didn't want to be the one to kill him. Like, Rachel's evil, but she's like a coward's sort of evil, where she wants the blood on Yura's hand, she wants to still think of herself as the good guy in a way, and she's motivated a lot off of fear, and that was the same thing we saw with her betraying Bomb, and we had the quote with her and um, Hua Ryun, where she was like, I want to see the stars because I'm afraid of the night, or something like that. So I really think that it's good symbolism, again, showing that she's afraid when she kills Akraptor. But um, then we have Akraptor's past finally explained. He had a wife from the Ten Families, and then her family took the wife and daughter back. Um, so the only clue that they could possibly have is that the wife has an engagement ring like what he wears, and that the wife may have given the engagement ring to his daughter. Uh, so, 
he talks about how Wagnon brought them all together as a family, and there would be no us without him. We cut back to Wagnon crying over his body when Joaquin returns with Misang, and he tells them that Prince chose to die. Um, so, of course, Wagnon blames himself for all of this because he sort of led the team, They and Akraptor died for him and everything. But, uh, I don't... It's very interesting that, like I said, Joaquin just tells them what happens. He, it, it just feels like there may be something more there. Um, not that Prince, it's impossible for Prince to die. Prince totally could have just been killed there, but it feels like SIU wouldn't have just done that. It feels like there's something more to it. Uh, so then at the very, very end, we have Kuhn bringing his food to Bomb. Apparently Bomb hasn't eaten or come out of his room. And uh, he's clearly very messed up because of apparently losing Rakiwa and Danwa. But SIU kind of hinted at them not being really dead. And I think most of us assume they're not really dead. Uh, so yeah, that was it part by part. Um, really, I, um, I'm waiting for the day in the storyline. I want them to meet Akraptor's daughter and like Wangnan to give Akraptor's ring to her. That would be just the greatest thing ever if they meet her climbing the tower somewhere or something, say she's a regular as well, and Wangnan gives her the ring. That'd be amazing. And I see a lot of people keep saying, oh, um, they keep bringing up the Anak story and saying, oh, what if he's Anak's father? I'm going to say definitely no. He said that they were from the Ten Families, but Anak's, like, Anak... It is kind of similar, but we have no clue if Anak's mother was from the Ten Families. And from everything that we've seen, it doesn't look like she was from the Ten Families. She was just a really remarkable regular that became a princess and then became a ranker. So I don't think that Anak is his daughter. Uh, would it be interesting? Sure, but I don't know. I kind of like the idea of having another new character rather than just throwing that onto Anak's story. Because Anak already has an awesome story. Um, also, I love the feels this chapter, and the most important part of this chapter is the what it did for the future, the questions it raised, because we just had, over the course of the Name Hunt Station arc, we had confirmation of the connection between Wangnan and Karaka and the Rings, we had confirmation of the Tenth Family, we had mounds and mounds of reveals and new information brought to us in the Name Hunt Station arc. So it's good that this gives us a lot more questions. Which family was Akraptor's family, or yeah, was Akraptor's wife and daughter from? Um, who are they? Do we already know them, or are we yet to meet them? And when we are to meet them, what are we going to do about it? Um, we have like, what are we going to do now? Rachel has Wangnan. How is Wangnan's character going to be affected by this? How is Misang's? Is Prince really dead? Is Joaquin really loyal to uh, Rachel? And what's going to happen when we see that Bomb is messed up, but when Bomb finally pulls it together, probably next week is when that group will have to move on and we'll jump back to that group. Um, unless we stick with Wangnan with Rachel's group a little bit longer, we'll probably just jump back to Bomb's group. What's his group going to do now? Um, and then what's going to happen when Bomb finds out? Bomb was part of that group that was like a family with Akraptor and Prince. When he finds out that they're dead, at least possibly, how is he going to flip out about that? Um, and they're like actually probably dead, not like the Rack kind of dead where he's probably not. So, um, yeah, I think that this, this chapter did a lot for the future. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And this too... I'm hoping that this gets rid of a theory that I've hated for a long time, and that's the Itachi Rachel theory, where Rachel is actually a good guy and she's just been doing all this different stuff to try to help Bomb, and there's going to be some big reveal where everything was supposed to work out a certain way and she was actually helping Bomb the whole time. I hate that theory because I like Rachel as a bad guy. She makes a very good villain. Pretty much everybody completely hates her which makes her a great villain. We we hate her as fans, and that's good. That's That makes her a good character, a good villain, and I think turning her into a good guy, going the Itachi route with her, would suck. I would not... 
I would not be happy with this. And for her to kill Akraptor like that, I think finally pushes it to the edge where we're like, okay, there's no way she cannot still be a good guy after freaking murdering Akraptor. It did seem like that she was scared and she didn't want to, but she's been a part of so much of this evil shit that um, I'm really hoping there's no way SIU can just say, oh, she was a she was a good guy all along. So I'm hoping this destroys that theory. Uh, so that's it. For the score, even though right now upon first reading I was like, I'm not sure if I liked it as much as I liked that, uh, what was it, the Ron vs. Indiana chapter or the um, Kaiser backstory chapter. While I'm like, I don't know if I liked it as much as those, I do have to say that this is going to be one of those chapters that I already know right now in a couple months as we've seen some new reveals and gone further, this is going to be one of those that I can go back and read and be like, this had so many connections to everything and was the start of so much stuff. So because of that, I would say that this deserves uh, 10 sacrifices out of 10, I guess. It's, it's got to be 10 out of 10 just because this is huge for the future of the story. Even though it doesn't seem huge right now, this leads into so much stuff that we're going to get into later. And uh, yeah, I guess that's my thoughts on this chapter. So either way, I really, really loved this one. I hope you guys did as well. So like if you liked the video and comment down there and tell me what you guys thought of this chapter and what you thought of my thoughts on it. Um, lots of questions brought up here. But uh, I hope you guys are looking forward to the future as much as I am, because that's this chapter really got me excited for so much stuff. I really want to see stuff with the Ten Families and Akraptor's Daughter and just so much stuff like that. See what Wangnan's going to do next. I'm really excited to see what he'll do next. Uh, just stuff like that. Subscribe for more Tower of God if you want as well, and follow on Twitter if you want as well. I'll try to keep you updated there on stuff for the channel. That's it, so thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.